gosh, um, after the after Burberry's and the royal wedding, this is going to be a bit of a come down. Um, <laughs> the, uh, um, uh, the, the, uh, the topic of my uh, talk is um, um, dismantling a mismanaged brand. The opposite of the previous session. <laughs> um, well, um, about 12 years ago, I um, I'd, I'd built myself a uh, do-it-yourself uh, ATM. Uh, and uh, stuck that into a, a wall in a slum. And uh, just to see what would happen, because uh, at that time, there were, there were no teachers, and there still aren't any teachers who would want to go into a slum and teach. One of the problems with this mismanaged brand education is that good teachers are never where they should be. They're always in rich, private organizations. So I put this uh, computer in there just to see what would happen. And I found, after a while, that the children who had not seen a computer before and didn't know any English, had not heard of the internet, were browsing. And uh, people said, well, that's very simple. Um, you know, Delhi is full of computer programmers and young people who know about computers. Somebody was passing by and showed them how to use the mouse. So I repeated the experiment. I said, I must try this somewhere where the chances of a passing software professional is very low. So I found, I found a village way out of Delhi, and I repeated the experiment. When I repeated the experiment, I found that the children were doing the same thing. Uh, I went back there after a couple of months, and uh, there were two children playing a game. And they, um, can you just go back once, please? Uh, uh, th there were a couple of children uh, playing a game, and uh, as soon as they saw me, they said, uh, we want a faster processor and a better mouse. <laughs> so so I, said, uh, I, I said, they're not supposed to be saying all this. And uh, they said, you know, this, uh, this thing over here, it works only in English, so we had to teach ourselves English in order to, teach it, uh, in order to use it. Uh, it's, really, it's really very difficult. But they were doing it. So I then got some funding to see if this would happen everywhere, or whether it was accidental. And I repeated this in uh, about 20 villages in India, uh, chosen for their geographical positioning and for their um, ethnic and genetic diversities. And, uh, and we found that it works exactly the same way everywhere. Um, uh, that, that little film clip will give you a glimpse of those years. Um, can you just go back and click, please? I can't go back with this. I can go only forward. Yeah. OK. That's the very first day at the Hole in the Wall, a 10-year-old with his 6-year-old student. These are the deserts of Rajasthan. They had discovered the sound recorder, and they were teach listening to their own music. <laughs> and so on, across village after village. So at the end of this period, I, I was measuring all along, and we got a learning curve, which was the same as children who were taught. And uh, that was kind of puzzling in those days. Remember, this is 10 years ago that how could this be happening just by itself? So we came to this conclusion that groups of children can learn to operate a computer uh, and the internet on, on their own, irrespective of who they are or where they are. So I started to get curious about what else they might be able to do by themselves. Um, in the city of Hyderabad, big sprawling city in uh, southern India, uh, I, I found myself a, an interesting problem. There were schools where children were learning English, but their pronunciation was terrible because they were copying the accents of their local teacher. So <laughs> I bought them a computer with a speech to text, uh, which you get free with Windows nowadays. I, I bought them one, uh, and I uh, connected it to the internet. And I said to them, um, uh, you know, uh, make yourself understood. 
They spoke into the computer. The computer produced absolute nonsense. So um, uh, uh, the children said, how, how do we make ourselves understood? So I invented a new educational method. I said, I have no idea. And anyway, I'm going away. <laughs> and, I, and I left them. When I came, when I came back two months later, uh, I met a little boy outside the classroom. And I said to him in English, Faizan, how are you? And Faizan looks up at me and says, fantastic. So I said, what's going on inside? They had downloaded the speaking Oxford dictionary. They were typing words into it. The dictionary was speaking it out. They were saying the word back into the text to speech and seeing if the computer produces it correctly. They had invented a pedagogy. So uh, I was getting more and more curious now. And the reports from the slums of Delhi were curious. The computers had been around for nine months. And the teachers were saying, you know, the standard of English of the children have increased absolutely dramatically. And uh, the quality of their answers to questions, their homework, is uh, just fantastic. It's very deep. And I thought, how can, a, how can a dirty old ATM stuck in a wall do all this for children? So I went to find out. And I uh, discovered the answer. Six months down the line, they had discovered Google. They were Googling their homework. So their English was perfect. <laughs> their answers were deep. <laughs> okay, And the teachers were stunned. And I thought to myself, my god, what have I done? <laughs> Is this learning? But I would get an answer to that question. Six years later, from Gateshead, England, which is what I have to tell you very quickly. Uh, here's a sample of, of those children in Hyderabad. Yes, my cousin. Yes, she's my cousin. Yes, yes, my cousin. Well, that girl's now 22. And um, some of you may actually know her, because she works for a call center in Hyderabad. Might have tried to sell you a credit card or something. <laughs> <laughs> so, good for her if she did. So at this time, I got an interesting phone call from the late uh, science fiction writer, uh, Sir Arthur C. Clarke, who had been following my work. And I went to meet him in Colombo. And he said two things to me, which I um, still remember, and I think all educators uh, should listen to. Uh, the first one was, a teacher that can be replaced by a machine should be. Okay. <laughs> the second was, when learners have interest, education happens. So armed with these two uh, 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 sentences, I started to research on what else can children learn all across Africa, across Cambodia, and so on, and, uh, and, and came to a rather interesting conclusion. Groups of children can navigate the internet to achieve educational objectives on their own. So far, school teachers were very good friends of mine. They used to say, it's wonderful. Children can teach themselves to use a computer. Children can improve their pronunciation. When I said this one, that they can achieve educational objectives on their own, they started to get a little grim and um, said, well, we don't know about that. By this time, I had come to this conclusion that groups of children can learn all sorts of things by themselves. The question was, is there something they couldn't learn? Well, we call this minimally invasive education. In 2006, Newcastle University got a large research fund for, uh, one back, please, um, a, a large research fund for uh, improving, of all things, the quality of education in uh, uh, Indian schools. And they called me. Uh, so uh, you know, I'd been working for 45 years in Delhi. So I looked up the weather in Newcastle, bought myself an overcoat, and moved there in 2006. Uh, having moved there, I gave a similar lecture to a faculty. And they said, uh, you know, you're a bit daft. You can't say that children can learn everything by themselves. So I said, well, let's design an experiment for something that children cannot learn by themselves. So I made a research question. Can Tamil-speaking children in a tsunami-hit village in southern India teach themselves the biotechnology of DNA replication in English from a roadside computer? OK? Said, this is going to be a cinch. 
<laughs> I'll give them a test, they'll get a zero. I'll give them a post test, they'll get a zero. I'll come back to Newcastle and say, we teachers, we need it. So off I went. I found myself a village. It's called Kali Kuppam, and it's in, uh, near Pondicherry in India. It was hit by the tsunami. Its school was destroyed. Most of the adult population dead. I had given the children in Kuppam two computers to play with, hole-in-the-wall computers. They were very good at that. Into those computers, I put in some material on biotechnology, DNA replication, and uh, said to the children, this is very important, but it's all in English, I'm afraid. So they looked at it and said, how can we understand it? It's full of diagrams and chemistry and big English words. So I used my educational method, and I said, I, I don't know how you'll understand it. Anyway, I'm going away. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I left them there. <laughs> I came back after two months, and uh, the children marched in looking very silent. I said, what did you understand? They said, nothing. I said, nothing? No, nothing at all. It's just way too hard. Um, so I said, well, how long did it take you to figure that out, that you can't understand it? So they said, no, we look at it every day. So I said, you, you don't understand anything, and you look at the same thing every day. So that little girl whose you know, bow you can see, she raises her hand. She was 12 then. And she says to me in broken Tamil and English, Apart from the fact that improper replication of the DNA molecule causes genetic disease, we've understood nothing else. <laughs> so, so, so I learned another lesson that when a child says, I, don't, I haven't understood, well, don't take him at face value. <laughs> you know, God knows what he's understood. So I post-tested them. I got an educational impossibility, 0 to 30% in two months, street side. Remember the context, street side, middle of that tropical afternoon, biotechnology of DNA replication in English on a roadside computer. It was impossible, but it had happened in Kalikupkam. But 30 is too bad because it's a fail. How do I get them to pass? I uh, found a friend that they had, a local girl who's 22. She's an accountant. And I asked her, listen, uh, can you teach them some more biotechnology? She said, absolutely not. I didn't have any science in school. I don't understand a word of what's going on on that screen. So I said, use the method of the grandmother. Stand behind them, and every time they do anything at all, just say, wow, that's fantastic. Can you do a little more of it? When I was your age, I could never have done anything like that. I was really stupid. <laughs> she did that for two more months. The scores jumped to 50%, same, <laughs> same as my control school in New Delhi with a trained biotechnology teacher. I returned to Newcastle, and I said, I haven't found it. I haven't found the limit I was looking for. It's just recently been published. So um, by this time, I thought it's time to say this. Groups of children can learn almost anything on their own. Um, that word almost, well, I want to get rid of it. But yes, at the moment, I'd say they can learn almost anything on their own. So having experimented all over the world in all these exotic locations, I came to the most remote and exotic place that I have ever been to, Gateshead, England. <laughs> oh, this one doesn't work with, with an English audience. In India, it works beautifully. <laughs> I was saying, 5,000 miles from New Delhi across the River Tyne is the hamlet of Gateshead. <laughs> and the audience goes gasp. <laughs> you know? So in Gateshead, I had a method. Take children, make them, tell them to make groups of four by themselves. You say, I don't know who your friends are. You can make groups of four. Every group of four must have one computer. Why one to four? That's what we learned at the hole in the wall. Usually, one computer surrounded by four or five children. You can talk as much as you like within your group. If you don't like your group, you can leave them and go away uh, to another group. Uh, you can talk across groups. You can go over to another group, look over their shoulders, see what they're doing, come back to your own group, and claim that it's your own idea. <laughs> I, uh, you know, in, in other words, uh, use, the, use the university research methodology. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm being unkind to my employer. <laughs> so, 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 uh, so they did this. I gave them six GCSE questions, six years ahead of their time. The best group got everything right in 20 minutes, the worst in 45. The teachers came back in. The teachers said, so what? So they've been using Google. They've been using Wikipedia. They've been using Answer Bag, Ask Jeeves. So what are you trying to prove? So I said, well, I'll come back in two months. I came back in two months. I gave them sheets of paper. And I said, answer those six GCSE questions without computers, without talking to each other. They got the same scores. 
This time, the teachers were stunned. They said they're reproducing those screens that they saw two months ago with photographic clarity. I don't know what went on inside that experiment, but two years later now, they can still say exactly what those answers are. Maybe because they had found it for themselves, and I hadn't told them. So we had the beginnings of a new method. And uh, here's a sort of brief glimpse. This is Gateshead. So it looks a bit chaotic, but it settles down. How far can we go? I got invited to tour in Italy to an Italian-speaking school, uh, 32 children. I made the groups of four using their teachers. Then the teachers said, how are you going to communicate with them? They speak only Italian. They don't understand a word of English. You don't speak any English, uh, any Italian. So I said, I don't know. But uh, you know, let, let's see what happens. So I started writing questions in English on the whiteboard. I wrote down, how did dinosaurs die out? The children said, can't understand anything. What's this? So I said, I bring all teachers back. They said, no, 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 no. We understand everything. <laughs> <laughs> they, typed, they typed the English sentence into Google Translate, got the Italian, fed it into the Italian internet, and got me the answer. I started writing more and more questions, and this is what happened. Twenty minutes later, the two main theories of dinosaur extinction. Next one didn't take them any time at all. Where is Calcutta? Just ten minutes, and they had it. Now I got really ambitious. Who was Pythagoras, and what did he do? These are ten-year-olds. This time there's silence for a while. Then one of them comes up to me and says, you've spelt it wrong. <laughs> Thirty minutes later, the right angle triangles. They had begun to type in Pythagoras' equation back into Google. Google was taking them off into Einstein's special theory of relativity, and they were going along. The Italian teachers came back and, and said to me something that I've never, ever heard a teacher say. They said, shall we stop them? <laughs> well, you have to decide. Well, uh, the, the method itself started to spread. Here's Melbourne. And the question started to get more complex. What happens after we die? Is GDP related to happiness? Can trees think? How does an iPad know where it is? Each one will lead them into a whole set of curricular points. The teacher can then pick that up. Like, how does an iPad know where it is? They figure out GPS, three satellites. Very quickly, they figure out the word trigonometry. Then I say to them, do you really want to know how to calculate where, where your iPad is? And they say, yeah. So then I tell the math teacher, well, I've just opened the door. You can teach as much trigonometry as you like. They won't fall asleep anymore. <laughs> it's a little bit on Hong Kong. So uh, in conclusion, groups of four and six, one computer per group, uh, unrestricted ac access, interesting questions is, is the key to the whole thing. E-mediation, discussion allowed, changing of groups, etc. Leave them alone. It's happening in dozens and dozens of schools in the Gateshead, Durham, and uh, Northumberland area. Every school reports the same findings, which I love, because uh, as you heard, I'm from physics. I like to have the same results from the same experiment. I think we need a new primary curriculum with just three things in it. Reading comprehension is the most important ability that you need in a child right now. Information searching and retrieval skills, 
is the second one. And the third one that I'm struggling with, if children are alone, they must have a rational system of belief, a way by which they know what to believe in. We all know that, but we weren't taught it. We developed it by ourselves. I need to find out how to teach that or how, how to allow children to, to, to get that. So what does it all mean? I think we've hit upon a self-organizing system. A self-organizing system is one where the system structure appears without any intervention from the outside, like a tornado. There's nothing to predict that it's going to happen, but then it would happen. Self-organizing systems show emergence. Things happen which were not designed for. And what I think is, is my speculation, well, emergence is like, you know, you look at a caterpillar, and there's nothing in the caterpillar which tells you it's going to form a cocoon from which a, a butterfly will come out. It's emergent. I think, and this is pure speculation, education is a self-organizing system where learning is the emergent phenomenon. You're free to believe it or not. I don't know the answer. I don't know if that is correct. But I'm going to go away now. And <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>